they were pretty heavily defended. If one had the misfortune to be hit anywhere there, there was no chance of any rescue. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to humans quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to swallow up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for your country. The volunteer for service was, in effect, to put your life on the line. I'm Alex Lloyd, and welcome to Life on the Line in 2024. Since 2017, we've released 279 podcasts, including 17 video episodes with 204 military veterans, told over seven seasons and two miniseries. With over 2 million downloads, streams and watches, we're honoured to continue telling the stories of Australian military veterans. Our first four seasons are also part of the Australian War Memorial National Archive, and our later seasons are gradually making their way there. This episode with World War II veteran Peter Whitehead kicks off our eighth year of podcasting. This is the start of season eight, which will be an ongoing season with no end date in sight. Episodes will drop when they're ready, so stay subscribed to us through social media, your favorite podcast app, or our website to never miss a veteran's story. Today's interview is with Peter Whitehead, a World War II veteran born in 1923. He tried to join the Royal Australian Navy when war broke out, but was rejected, instead becoming a rough rider with the 2nd Remount Unit based at Holsworthy in Sydney. After breaking in thousands of horses to support domestic war operations, he managed to join the Royal Australian Air Force, qualifying as a gunner. Peter was sent to one of the first B-24 Liberator squadrons in New Guinea and then flying bombing missions in the Pacific War from Darwin to Moratai. Today, Peter lives in New Zealand and turned 100 years old on Christmas Day, 2023. He co-wrote his memoir, Buana, There's a Body in the Bath, with international best-selling Australian author, Tony Park. Tony, an army veteran and previous guest on this podcast, interviewed Peter over an international Zoom call for Life on the Line. I'm Tony Park a guest presenter for Life on the Line, and I'm speaking to Peter Whitehead from his home in New Zealand. Peter, you were born in 1923 to a British expatriate family living in Shanghai. How was it that you ended up in Australia at the outbreak of the Second World War? At the 1937 invasion of China, My father was absorbed by the Japanese invading forces and uh, actually died in their care, as a result of which my mother, who was overseeing the education of the family, uh, was running short of cash. And it appeared to me as a very negligent or recalcitrant student that I would be better employed out of the way than uh, staying around and using unnecessary resources. So I, with my mother's aid, got involved in a group called the Big Brother Movement, uh, which exported naive young people uh, from England to Australia to work in a rural environment. I finished up in Australia in a rural environment. I must admit that whilst many of the people involved in those schemes of those days had a pretty rough time of it, I personally had a very good time of it. So I can't complain whatsoever. Yeah, I think for our our listeners, it's a snapshot of a very different time when you and your family have moved from from Shanghai back to the UK, as you said, after the Japanese invasion or around about that time. 
And you put yourself on a boat as a 13-year-old to come out to Australia. Absolutely. A, a very adventurous start to life. And what sort of work were you doing at the time that the war was declared on those rural properties? My first exploitation, and I speak of exploitation on the part of the person who employed me, was as a, a wooden water joey on a sheep and wheat station uh, just on the western side of Cowra in New South Wales. My job started at about half past four in the morning and finished about half past seven at night, six days a week. And for that, I was remunerated with five shillings a week in my keep. Amazing. And you also had a particular interest in horses as well too, didn't you? Well, my main interest in going to Australia was to get involved in riding buck jumping horses and enjoying thrills of being a rodeo rider. So I put most of my spare time as even on that particular job, riding bareback and doing things like that to try and improve my so-called horsemanship. And then at the end of six months uh, employment in Tara, I'd had enough of that particular type of uh, rural endeavour and fired myself and went down to Sydney and got a job in the northwest of New South Wales, where I was lucky enough to be employed by a man who was horse mad, ran quite a large uh, sheep and cattle station and was interested more in his horses than he was in his sheep and cattle. And he and I got on very well together, and he taught me basic concept of breaking in horses, as it was known at that particular time in those parts of the country. War is declared in 1939, and because you had been born on Christmas Eve, you were you would have still been 16 at that time. You you still Correct. had family in the UK, your your mother and your siblings, and I believe they became oh. involved in the war at an early age. What was happening back in the UK with your family? Every one of them joined up. Uh, certainly they were all deeply involved. But as I say, I was pretty remote from their experiences and mail and so forth was not a a high order in my way of life. Having said that, when I got to an age where I was big enough and looked mature enough, I went down to Moor Park and enlisted in the army. I wasn't given much of an opportunity to select what I wanted to do. I was sent out to second remount depot at Holdsworthy, tested for my skills as a horsebreaker which apparently passed the test because I didn't get back from Holdsworthy. Well, I think it was probably three months. I understand that initially you tried to join the Navy, but were unsuccessful. Oh, oh that, that was before I, I decided to join the Army. I initially thought the Navy was a, a good way of possibly getting back to the UK and seeing my parents. But um, they turned me down because I failed what was in effect a literacy test and so as soon as i found out that i was no longer a naval prospect i joined the army yes and so you you mentioned the second remount unit i think it's a very interesting what was happening in australia at that time so this was a, a unit of people like yourselves, rough riders, horsemen. What was your job and, and why was it so important at that very early stage of the war? Incredibly interesting you ask that because I have just uh, been given a book on the life and work of Banjo Patterson, who was the a great Australian poet. In the book, in the prose section of the book, there is an article written by Patterson, who apparently was a major in the 1914-18 war. He was part of a remount unit that was sent from Australia to Egypt. He describes the 
A, environment of the unit, and B, the attitude of the unit to the army and to its job, I was amazed to see that the absolute identical attitudes were taken with in the Second World War when I was shipped out with a lot of other similar characters, although I must admit that I was the youngest of the lot, to Holdsworthy, where the attitude was that the permanent members of the army who supervised the remounts stood back and, and let the hostilities only appointees get on with providing vast numbers of horses for both the light horse old not permanent army unit but put together units for coast watching which required such members of the 1418 war people to check the coast of of uh, australia from queensland down to sydney the general environment of the thing was that it was a, a group of people working for the army, within the army, but not off the army, if you get what I mean. Yes, because, I mean, I understand you didn't even go through basic military training, did you? For three months, I didn't even have the beginnings of a uniform, let alone anything other than that. And I never, having left Moore Park, I never got back to it. <laughs> And so at that early stage of the war, given the shortage of motor vehicles at the Second World War, horses became very important once again, as you say, for coast watching, but also old First World War equipment like the old GS horse-drawn wagons were pressed into service. Yes, again, weren't they? That's correct. Initially, the panic to get the horses out into the field was to conserve fuel and vehicles for training for the combat and the supply of uh, resources to training units was to be undertaken by those old GS wagons and horse-drawn equipment to conserve petrol and, and vehicles. The army obviously took the decision to do a panic supply as I say, in my short period of time, which was about 20 or 22 months with them, we actually processed, I'll use the word process specifically, well over 7,000 head of horses. That is quite incredible, that amount of work in such a short time that was vital to the war effort. And so many horses passed through your care or your training I believe from your from your book, which we co-wrote, one of there's a body in the bath, that there was at least one horse in particular who stuck in your memory, a horse by the name of Molly. Can you tell us about your encounters with that horse? During my short period of time with the remount, the main source of non-official activity was to go around the countryside attending little rodeos most of them were being run on behalf of the red cross to supply funds and money for the red cross one such exercise took place in a place called queen Beanne in southern new south wales where they ran quite a big rodeo for the red cross and we were permitted by a unit commander to go down and attend this thing, providing we were back on Monday morning for work. I was part of the little group that went down to Queen Deanne, and in the course of my riding, uh, exhibiting my riding, I got well and truly hammered by a Monero Brumby, uh, whose name was given to her probably on the radio ground that particular day, but she was called Easy Molly. She was anything but, if it hadn't been for the quick thinking of a good friend of mine at the time, who was picking up when she attacked me on the ground, having well and truly thrown me, he was able to drive her off and keep his horse between her attacks on me and the people who came with the stretcher to pick what was left of me up to go to the hospital. Some time later, 
a large shipment of horses came up from the Monero to the remount depot, and I wasn't, well, I, I must admit to being quite surprised to recognize the Easy Molly in there, in the mob that came up. You met Molly again when she came up with a batch of horses from the Monero area to be trained. Yes, so a whole bunch of real rat bag brumbies were shipped up as the supply of reasonable sorts of horses was getting pretty short. When they were being unloaded from the train, I was part of the party that was unloading them and running them down to the paddocks, and I saw Easy Molly coming down out of the train, and I recognized her and put my thumbprint on her uh, so that when she w came in for into the yard for processing, she was mine. We went through all the necessaries and got into the, the riding yard where we had a particularly bloody encounter, but luckily I finished up on top. And she eventually became quite a, a genuine worker on behalf of the army going down to Hay, I think it was, in uh, southern New South Wales to become part of a transport company there supplying the prisoner of war camp. Amazing. And then eventually, as I guess the army got more motor vehicle resources, the work of the remounts, the second remounts came to an end. And so what were your options then? You still wanted to stay in the fight, as it were, didn't you? Being a volunteer, when the pressure came off, and it was obvious, I'm talking now in late 41, early 42, the need for the amount of horses in Australia were, had dropped off and it was made evident to all of us hostilities only people that those that didn't join the AIF as opposed to the permanent forces, they were given the opportunity to find other employment or go into the AIF. I had initially signed up for the AIF, so I was automatically in process to join an active service unit, which, strangely enough, was being put up by some deluded gentlemen in, obviously, the headquarters, because they, they had come up with a plan to fly horses into New Guinea and drop them by parachute, together with 3.7 howitzer break down heavy artillery units and they would wander around in the jungle. The, the plan was that they would wander around in the jungle, leading their horses and carrying these howitzers and pack saddles and things and all the equipment that goes with them and harass the Japanese. Now, I don't know how, who conceived of that idea, but it was beyond belief. Anyway, I went down to Randwick with the first draft of horses that was being sent down to them for training for this sort of thing. And in the course of our training, we had to all take a medical to prove that we would be fit to do it. And when the, the doctor saw my medical sheet as a result of Easy Molly's things and one or two other busters I'd had in the, the unit, uh, he said that I would not be fit for active service and that the best that they could offer me was a job as a po juggler in the hospital. And I said, no, I'm not going to have that. I definitely, that's not on. So they said, well, the only alternative is that you can take a discharge and get a civilian a journey job on, on some prescribed enterprise. I was pretty disappointed with that, and I, I thought it was a bit unfair. So I went down to the Air Force and asked them if they would be interested and they appeared to think it was a reasonable proposition and so i transferred from the army to the air force and i never regretted it at all now i understand that uh, you volunteered for pilot training but that would have involved you sitting another exam and yes, of course you'd been rejected by the navy because you'd failed the, <laughs> the literary you failed the literary test how did you go about preparing for the entrance exams for pilot training? Well, the CEO of the remount unit, whose two brothers, he was a veterinarian, and he was in a prescribed occupation and had been sidelined to go to the remount unit. 
But his two brothers were over in England flying single-engine aircraft. He had wanted to go with them, but hadn't been allowed to. And when he heard of my dilemma and my lack of ability to, to pass any reasonable test of intelligence or schooling, he said he would, if I would be prepared to be his batman, he would spend the time preparing me to pass the entrance exam in, uh, to get into the Air Force. But that's exactly what he did. He spent, I think we spent 90 days where he crash taught me the basics of arithmetic and all the rest of the stuff that was necessary to pass the 10 papers that the Air Force required you to be competent in before joining air crew. Transferees from the Army to the Air Force were only allowed in case of air crew. Ground staff was not permitted, so I had there was no opportunity there. As a result of his valiant efforts, I managed to scrape through the initial test, then sent to Bradfield Park for basic training, and then selected as a pilot trainee to go down to Narandra, EFTS at Narandra. I was deeply involved in learning to fly, but my instructor, who was a, another, he was a station owner's son and was well conversed with Bushman, he and I were quite friendly, and he was very unhappy at having been selected to become an instructor as he wanted to get on to active service. And he told me, he said that there were so many pilots graduating and the tide of the war was turning and the chance of a pilot of my vintage actually seeing any active service would be very, very slim. As a result of our discussions, we both went to see the CO of the training unit at Narandra, and I put my case to him that maybe it would be a, a good idea if I were allowed to go to a gunnery training unit, which was only six weeks training, then I would have a possibility of seeing active service. And he, being a very sensible fellow, said, OK, we'll have a go and see what you can do. Then it turned out the maximum height for a, an air gunner was under six foot, and I was six foot one and a half. And so that seemed to be a stumbling block. However, he let me go up to Sydney and go to the recruit depot and see if I could manoeuvre my height from six foot one down to below six foot. And again, somebody up there must have been looking after me because the sergeant in charge of medical records at the recruit centre was a fellow who had been down at Narandra when I had been carted in having concussion from being kicked in the face by a horse I was trying to help a fellow break in. He knew me and he was very friendly in his approach and when he heard my story he said oh this is no problem and he got my records out and he marked me down to five foot eleven and seven eight so that i could be under the six foot mark and remustered to a an air gunner and that was accepted and i left around and went down to victoria i think it was to sail i'm not sure so, Peter, basically, you falsified your age to join the army, and then you falsified your height to become an air gunner. You were then sent to East Sail for gunnery training. Tell us what that involved. I actually naively thought that if I worked hard and came somewhere near the top of the course, I would go over to the UK, where they, were, they had quite a bit big attrition problem with air gunners. But I was wrong. I came second top of the course and was second in line to remain in Australia, to be part of the Australian effort moving over to heavy bombers as the tide of the war started to go back up through the Pacific. I was one of the first groups of troops to, to convert on to the Browning fire. Uh, 50 mil caliber guns. Then I was sent up to Townsville for onward transport to 
a place called Nadzab, which had just been taken from the Japanese. So at East Sale, you were training on uh, the 303 machine guns initially, is that right? Correct. Or 90% of the English or British service groups were all working with 303s, whereas the Americans worked with uh, 50 caliber. And so you went to, I believe, a base called Rathmines uh, up near Newcastle, in New South Wales, to, to learn the 50 caliber. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, it was a very short course, and a delightful one. They trained us on the only 50 caliber weapons that the Australian Air Force had at the time, which were mounted in the blisters of uh, their uh, air sea rescue aircraft, Catalinas. Catalinas, yes. We flew around pooping off out of these the blisters at oil barrels in the water and learning to treat stoppages and things like that. That was sufficient. I think that the course probably lasted about two weeks, something like that, of that order. Then we were shipped up to Townsville, where we were crewed up and sent over to, to Nazab, where I think we were probably the second or third group to go in there, where we were allocated to the Americans as an entire crew, flew there in their aircraft on a acclimatization and training effort, whilst the Australian Air Force were acquired the B-24s, and as soon as they had enough to put up a, a squadron or, or maybe even two, I'm not sure, we were shipped back to Australia and went up to Darwin, became part of what 20, I, I personally became part of 24 squadron in the RAAF and flew from Darwin all over the South Pacific. When you got to NADZAB in New Guinea, you were transitioned on to American B-24 Liberator bombers. Tell us about the Correct. Liberator. What sort of aircraft was it? And perhaps tell us about some of those early missions in New Guinea as you were learning. Well, them. it was total chaos when we got there. As I say, it had only just been taken from the Japanese. The place was full of emergency forward operations work, if that means anything. We were commissioned to fly onto the attacking the retreating Japanese north and east of us. But it was a huge, huge, huge American effort. And our few crews were scattered amongst their squadrons. It was a very rough, uncomfortable, but it wasn't the worst of what was going on in the place at the time. So one can't criticize. Then we went, as I say, we were ship back to mainland Australia to form our respective RAF squadrons who were then used as our main part of the big push. We hear and read quite a bit about Bomber Command's operations in Europe, as you mentioned before, flying from England and the Australian effort there. Perhaps not as many people are aware of the scale of the effort that was happening from Australia in the Pacific. What sort of missions were you flying from Darwin at that time of the war in the Liberator? We flew bombing missions, anti-shipping missions, air sea rescue missions, and quite a number of flights included what I would call, or what are now probably called special services people, who were taken over as far as Borneo, and dropped into the jungles there to try and muster up some support from the locals. It was very varied. The main thing was to harass the Japanese in islands from Timor West. And then as the tide of the war started to go further and further north, we were moved in a very small token detail the particular group I was with, up to the Halmahiras, to yes. a place called Moritai. And from there, I understand we, you were uh, bombing targets such as the oil fields on, on Borneo, those sort of strategic targets? Correct. Correct. The, they were our main missions, and they were missions that took in about 16 hours flying. They were very tense 
because it was all over open water, except for a slight diversion over what was then called the Celebes. I don't know what they call them now, but they were called the Celebes in those days. The Celebes Islands were the source of quite a lot of war material for the the Japanese, and it was very heavily guarded. As a result, one had a brief moment of full concentration whilst we crossed them and then got as far as Borneo, where our main target were the oil fields in, in, in um, I can't remember the name of the place. Balak, Balak Papen, I think, isn't it? Bal- Balak Papen, yes, Balak Papen. They were pretty heavily defended too, so that if one had the misfortune to be hit anywhere there, there was no chance of any rescue. Once we, on our eastward journey home, if we got over the Celebes again unscathed, you still had about four and a half, five hours of flying over open water, which was a pretty fairly unforgiving thing because, as I say, we flew quite a few air sea rescue missions, and I don't ever remember locating any downed air crew. There's a very poignant passage in your book, Juana, There's a Body in the Bath, where you talk about flying those AC rescue missions and I think on a couple of occasions actually faintly picking up a signal, a distress signal, yet still being unable to locate the downed airmen. That's quite true. I was, uh, one was equipped with those things, that the radio transmitters called, I think they call them Gibson Girls. They were hand-operated signals And we also had yellow fluorescent dyes so that if you had been lucky enough to escape your airplane in one piece and managed to get one of the survival rafts out of the airplane and you yourself had gotten into it with your Gibson girl and your bottle of water or whatever, and then you could spread this dye out, which was uh, thought to be able to attract attention from the air. With all those devices, as I say, on one or two occasions, we could actually hear the people transmitting. But flying around trying to locate was a waste of time. We never did. That part of the war and those bombing operations had challenges of their own. I think it's interesting that a a bomber crew was expected or lucky to complete 30 missions when flying from England over Germany. Yet your war seems to be more of a long haul. And I mean, how many sorties, how many missions would you and your crew have flown? Far too many for one's comfort, because as a token force in the American Air Force, our presence was required on virtually every mission, whereas the the Americans had vast resources and their crews used to fly on an average of once every 10 days. Our presence in their efforts uh, required us to fly every second day. The few crews that were allocated to the the group in the Halma Heroes required us to fly every second day. And the bulk of our missions were never less than than 12 hours. Most of them were up to 16 hours. And it was all over open water, or 99% over open water, It wasn't necessarily enemy activity that would cause your aircraft to malfunction. They were being very heavily used, hard used, and the ground crews were thin on the ground, living in the most incredibly awful conditions. The food was gruesome, yet those aircraft kept flying. Uh, A huge compliment both to the quality of the aircraft and more especially to the maintenance crews who got the aircraft ready in less than 24 hours to go back out again and do another 16 hours. You talk about the different kinds of dangers and threats. I understand your your worst moment or worst landing came as a result of bad weather. Yep. We flew one aircraft that got picked up in a huge QNIM cloud and buffeted around to the extent the fore and aft axis of the aircraft had been twisted about 12 to 15 degrees out of true when we finally hit the shore because we couldn't make it to to the airfield. The thing wobbled up to the shore and just expired 
at the high the high water mark, and we were able to climb out and walk away, which was very lucky. It was a shaky old do, and, and the aircraft was strapped, obviously, without bothering to do anything further. It's an incredible image when you think of that huge four-engine bomber being caught yeah. in basically turbulence or a downdraft, and when it lands, it's so bent out of shape that it can't even sit on its three wheels. That's a, a testament yeah. to the power of Mother Nature. Tell us about your crewmates, Peter. You were a mid-upper gunner, and I believe the gunnery controller. Who were your crewmates, and what sort of backgrounds did they come from? I know our skipper was a, an accountant and a second pilot whose daughter I'm in current contact with in Australia. He was a farmer. I think the rest of them were all rather like myself, come by chance, people who didn't really have any serious... Oh, the, the bombardier was a publican. The navigator, I think he was a student. But for the rest of them, the gunners and the engineer and so on, they were all sort of non-committed personnel, if I could use the word. In other words, they didn't have any trades or anything. And I think as, a, as an interesting footnote, perhaps for the listeners, there is a B-24 currently being restored at Werribee in Victoria. I believe that lady in question, uh, Ms. Chaffee, uh, was the one that was related to the second pilot there. And I believe it's the only liberator in the Southern Hemisphere. That's quite right. There is another big group or, or family of people who in northern New South Wales, whom I have been lucky enough to contact, whose father was, as far as I can gather, he was a week earlier than my group that went up to NADZAB. They were there about five days before we were. Then where he went, I don't know, but they're deeply into the B-24s, and I put them in touch with Lynn Gorman, uh, Max Chaffee's daughter. Apparently, they have been in close contact. Maybe we've done some good there. I don't know. An injury you sustained during the war, which I believe still gives you some trouble in terms of loss of hearing, came about not as a result of enemy fire, but as a result of having a cold. Tell us about that mission and, and why you chose to fly well, with a head cold. We had found that if there was a substitute in a crew, due to some reason the man couldn't fly, they often didn't come home. So we had made in our little crew a deal that if somebody couldn't fly, nobody flew. I got a cold and under normal circumstances it would have backed off. But having this set up, I flew. As a result of the altitude, my ears blocked completely, and uh, I had to go back to Darwin eventually. Well, the crew went back anyway for a, a rest and recreation break, and I went to the hospital in Darwin where they performed some prehistoric medical exercises on me to try and get me to hear. And as soon as I could hear the slightest squeak, I said I was cured and went back to work, which didn't do me any good at all, and I've been deaf ever since. Oh, dear. Peter, you, um, you were promoted. You became a commissioned officer as a gunner, as a, as a senior gunner, and in your book you talk about being on Moritai when the Americans have, have dropped the atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I was interested to see that you described the end of the war as a complete letdown. Why was that? Oh, after the war, yes, indeed, because we were stuck in Moritai and there was no use for gunners and bombardiers and people like that. They wanted pilots and navigators and radio operators, but nobody else. Aircraft were taken over to quite rightly transporting recently relief prisoners of war from, from Changi and places like that. But we extraneous personnel were shipped over piecemeal to Darwin and then down to our various home states and gotten rid of as quickly as possible. That's what happened. I mean, was, you weren't even a number. You were just a, a group of, of things that had to be moved and gotten rid of as quickly as possible. We hear so often, even these days, experiences of veterans who've gone through similar situations from being part of such a 
close-knit team to the next day being disbanded and, and sent off on your own devices. What was made available to you after the war? I can't say too much about the quality of what was offered to us. It was the best that could be offered. As I say, having been turned down as illiterate by the Navy, when I signed off, I was offered tertiary education with no, no strings attached. Uh, needless to say, being as lackluster as I possibly could be, I took the option. didn't require me to make any decisions. I utilised the tech service facilities. It wasn't any fault of theirs that I couldn't, I didn't finish. I completed one course, uh, a diploma course at an agricultural college, went to the university all on the on the uh, ex service tab, then found I couldn't live on the allowance once I'd run out of my three years. I drove a cab in Sydney at night and at the weekends to, to make ends meet, which wasn't conducive to being a a really good student in the veterinary facility in Sydney. And so I failed, and that's when I went to uh, left Australia and went to Africa. In the course of your the next 60 years, which is covered in the book that we co-wrote, Peter and I, Buana, There's a Body in the Vast, we talk <laughs> about his, his many adventures in many different countries within the continent of Africa over the subsequent 60 years. Peter, just to finish off the life on the line, I just want to ask you, Two questions. When you look back at your your service during the war, which encompassed almost the entire Second World War, what was the worst thing about your experience during the war and what was the best? Oh, I think the worst, uh, the most gut-wrenching was flying over water. There's a certain amount of high tension, apprehension when anti-aircraft shells are bursting around you but so long as they're not hitting you or not making any real dents in you it doesn't you know it's it's not, it's not so bad when you turn for home and you know you've got a long way to go and the aircraft has been a bit bent with a, a, a few holes in it one wonders whether one's going to make it and knows that if the thing starts to go down very little chance of being picked up and i put that down as probably the worst experience and the best experience of course was all the many friends that i've made i was not a particularly social type of person but i had lots of friends during my time in the services i think that was probably the best thing that's great peter thank you very much for all of that and although I know all the stories, it's so wonderful to hear them, hear them again. Well, that's very kind of you, Tony. No problem at all. Our thanks go to Tony for jumping on as a special guest interviewer for this conversation with Peter Whitehead. I interviewed Tony about his army service, including his deployment to Afghanistan in Season 4, Number 81, Tony Park. The scary thing about it, Alex, is how quickly it all becomes normal, how quickly you accept that life in Afghanistan is about people shooting each other and about old landmines going off. Tony also featured that year in Christmas on the Line, Volume 3. Lying by a pool, wondering where my pistol was. Wondering why I was back with my wife, which was fantastic. To reconnect with people and all of these things in your life that you didn't know how much you missed and you didn't know how much you appreciate. I interviewed Tony again in the fourth episode of our YouTube video documentary miniseries, Life After Service. I'm just lucky, you know. So when I hear the stories of veterans who are struggling, even today, of people who've attempted suicide and those whose lives have been lost, unfortunately, I can see how it's happened and, and how real the problem is. For more World War II stories, check out our first video documentary miniseries on YouTube called the school and country. We also contributed to Michael Veach's best-selling World War II biography, Barney Greatrex. Angus, Thomas and I have also interviewed a range of World War II veterans on this podcast. Number four, Guy Griffiths. Number seven, Tom Hughes. Number 11, Andrew Robertson 
Number 14, Hugh Kelly. Number 20, Doug Gilling. Number 27, Victor Power. Number 34, Anthony Greatrex. Number 40, Rothsay Swan. Number 42, Jack Bell. Number 55, Avis Quarrel. Number 59, Arthur Atkins. Number 71, Bob Semple. And number 127, Reg Chard, also a video podcast. Many of them are sadly no longer with us, so please check out their stories. Follow us on social media at Life on the Line Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, at LOTL Pod on Twitter, and at Thistle Productions on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to our newsletter via our website, www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget. <laughs>